There should be an outline in your bulletin there. Um, we're calling this um, The Great Disconnect. And um, I actually borrowed that from um, a recent study and publication by George Barna. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, this is Memorial Day weekend, as we just mentioned. We're so grateful for the, the veterans who served our nation and served others. Uh, we're so thankful for this opportunity to remember those who have passed away. Um, it's also a time to remember choice servants of the Most High God. And um, so we find ourselves in the church calendar. Um, we just had Ascension Day last Thursday. 40 days, uh, you remember Jesus told them to wait, and, and um, 40 days later, he was uh, showing himself by many convincing proofs, and then he ascended. They saw him do that, and away he went, and the angels promised he's going to come back the same way. And then he had told them in that ascension thing, he gave them a couple of uh, interesting instructions, and we're going to explore some of those here in a minute, but one was to wait for uh, the Holy Spirit to come upon them, and that happened, um, we're celebrating that next Sunday, a Pentecost Sunday. But I want, to, um, I want to talk about a man in particular. Um, his name was John Chow, and I'll see if I can get this thing working here. Um, he was, uh, this year, he's been recognized. I, I guess that's probably the bad choice of words. He has, um, four years ago, he was martyred. He was murdered by some people. And this year, the Voice of the Martyrs have uh, chosen to remember him as, um, as a martyr. And uh, his death caused a lot of consternation, a lot of activity on the internet and the interweb and all that stuff. Um, some praising his commitment, his love for Jesus Christ, his sacrifice. But a lot of people, and some Christians in, included, um, mocked him and castigated him and said he was foolish and he put himself in a dangerous situation where he had no business being. And they even went so far, some of them, to say uh, this great commission that Jesus gave just before he ascended into heaven was not for John Chow. In fact, they would say it's not for you either. It was just for the 11 who were there on that day when they saw him ascend. And the Great Commission has been fulfilled, and you guys don't need to worry about it. And he died needlessly. Well, this ascension that we talk about accomplished a number of things. It allowed God to exalt his son, Jesus Christ, to his proper place. It allowed Jesus to receive the glory he temporarily uh, set aside when he became a man, the incarnation. It allowed Jesus to initiate his high priestly ministry. He's up there interceding for us right now. Um, in fact, these feeble little prayers that I offer, uh, the Holy Spirit is able to take those and uh, change them into something meaningful to talk to uh, our Heavenly Father. It allowed Jesus to send the Holy Spirit to begin his empowering ministry. He said, uh, not many days from now, he told them, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Why? For power. And that power is for a particular reason. It's to become his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. And then um, the last thing here, allow Jesus to deliver the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, ethne, um, ethnic groups. So it's not just national boundaries, but it's uh, people groups within those national boundaries. Uh, Jesus Christ loves them wants to save them, and how is he going to do that? He's sending us. But there's an alarming number of people who say that was for then, it's certainly not for now. And there are people who say we have no business engaging in cross-cultural ministry. Who do you Christians think you are? As if you have the only answer to uh, sin and heaven and hell, and shame on you for bringing your white Western philosophies into these ethnic groups. And we have to address those concerns. Why? Because they're getting louder. And there are some people who used uh, John Chow's tragic death to make their point. But what did Jesus say? Well, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, 
but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, notice that they're still thinking Old Testament kingdom. And now they thought it was going to happen before he was killed. But now that he conquered death, he's alive, he's showing himself. Oh, well, maybe now is the time. And they said, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He did not say, oh, give, give up on that idea. That's Old Testament stuff. There's no more kingdom talk. No, he said, it's just not for your business. It's none of your business to know when. You do what I tell you. And so he says here, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Um, since there was only one ascension, a lot of people um, put these two commissions together. Uh, Matthew 28 is uh, really the most famous of the great commissions. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, he couldn't have been talking about the Old Testament uh, dispensation, that age, because that wouldn't be much of a promise. I'm with you for one more day. No, he's talking about the new age that's coming when you receive power, and Dan talked about it in Sunday school this morning, the birthday of the church, Acts chapter 2, the indwelling Holy Spirit ministry started then, and oh, by the way, it will end at the rapture, when um, the body of Christ is called to be with Jesus Christ forever. Doesn't mean the ministry of the Holy Spirit ceases. It means the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit stops. So the church had a definite start, Pentecost chapter 2, and it will have a definite end, Second Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, at the rapture, other scriptures as well. The question is, is this great commission for us today? And as I mentioned, there's an alarming and louder and louder demand for we, especially Western Christians, Keep your stupid religion to yourself. Other people are doing just fine without you. And why in the world would you risk your life to go to some place and get yourself killed? Well, here's John Chow. Um, as I mentioned, the Voice of the Martyrs uh, put them on their, his magazine this month, um, recognizing his martyrdom. And um, 27 years old. But from high school, he wanted to be a missionary. And uh, as, as he went off to college, his vision uh, got clearer and clearer on where he wanted to go. He wanted to go to unreached people groups. He wanted to go where there is no church. And not only that, there's no scriptures in their language. Why? Because he believes that Jesus Christ's commandment to go and make disciples of all ethnic groups is for us today. What I, I found interesting is that he uh, spent some of his summers not far from here. Uh, he worked as, um, uh, as his, uh, his summers in college, he worked as an EMT, um, a wilderness EMT at Whiskey Town Lake. And um, he was training himself so that when he went to this unreached people group, he could bring some skills to help them with medical needs and, and uh, emergencies and that type of thing. Um, I feel a kinship with him on a, long, a lot of levels because just two weeks ago, Julie and I went to Whiskey Town Lake and uh, we climbed up to Whiskey Town, uh, Whiskey Creek Falls. Um, hadn't been discovered until 20 years ago. And uh, I, Julie calls it a hike. It was a death march. It was 3.4 miles straight up. I think both directions, I'm not sure. But uh, when we got back, I couldn't walk for three days. But um, 
Whiskey Town Lake. There was John there just a few years ago uh, preparing himself to go to a faraway place that had never heard the gospel before. This is the night before he was killed. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to those people. November 16th, 2018. Um, the next day, uh, he had made contact with them the previous day. Uh, he went a second time that same afternoon. In fact, the way he got there, it's a little tiny island out in um, southeast of India. It's owned by India. But man, nobody goes there. Why? Because visitors get killed. So people are saying, you know, what an idiot. He knew that before he went. And he had to engage some fishermen, their boats, to haul him to this little island. And they dropped him off, and he brought some gifts there, left them, and left the island. Came back that afternoon, did it again, but he could tell uh, they weren't real open. And so he penned this in his journal. And he said, um, watching the sunset, and it's beautiful, crying a bit, wondering if this will be the last sunset I see before being in the place where the sun never sets. Tearing up a little. God, I don't want to die. So he didn't have a death wish. He had a, a life-saving message he wanted to share. I don't want to die. Who will take my place if I do? Why did a little kid have to shoot me today? That afternoon, uh, one of the young people being trained by the older people to not allow visitors, shot him with an arrow. He survived it. And he said, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to try again. He did. And um, he was murdered. Now, this uh, Bob Steddensticker, I don't know him, but he sounds like he's a Christian, or at least kind of a, a little bit familiar with the Bible. He said, John Chow, the missionary who was killed a few weeks ago, he, they wrote this in December of 2018, um, by the inhabitants of a small island in the Indian Ocean, the North Sentinel Island, was arguably brave and selfless in his desire to spread the gospel. The tragedy was that his sacrifice was for nothing, even within a Christian context. The Great Commission, the charge Jesus gave to spread the gospel, wasn't given to him. In fact, it wasn't given to anyone now living, and the Bible makes that clear. Well, uh, if that's true, let's just fold up our tents. Let's quit giving to foreign missions. Let's quit encouraging people to be trained in different languages and, and missionology and, and understanding different cultures and how to approach them. If this is true, that the Great Commission was just for those 11 guys, how do we even share Jesus Christ with people? My neighbor, my neighbor is from another country. He's Hispanic, he's Catholic, and we're friends. Am I not supposed to share the gospel with him because he has a different cultural background? This has long-reaching ramifications. Is the Great Commission for us today or not? Well, Seddensticker says, uh, Jesus wasn't talking to you. It's not everyone's job to evangelize. And there's no need for the Great Commission. Now, I can understand this coming from atheists and mockers and unbelievers. It's coming from Christians increasingly. You evangelicals who are trying to bring the good news to people who don't want it. Shame on you. In fact, you get what you deserve. They said that about John Chow. <clears throat> Here's, um, you know, you go online, you can Google some of this stuff. I don't recommend it. But the, the white savior complex is an antiquated notion that refuses to die. By the way, um, he has a Chinese father. So this idea of the white savior 
complex is a little strange. While I do not celebrate this missionary's death, neither do I mourn him. These people have managed to live without Christian mythology for untold centuries and did not need his input on any subject. They're running around naked, killing people. They have no hope of heaven. It seems to me they do need some kind of input from somebody who knows God. Missionaries have done quite enough damage to the world, and they are a species that needs to go extinct. That's a kind of a veiled threat. You guys keep messing with other cultures. Shame on you. We wish you guys don't, didn't even exist. Here's another one. Chow is dead because he was selfish. Evangelicals played a role in his death, and they are twisting themselves into all kinds of knots trying to assuage their guilt. Want to avoid guilt for this kind of thing in the future? Stop pushing your blankety-blank-blank religion on people. That's directed at us. We're not supposed to share the only name given among men whereby we must be saved? That sounds like that's from the devil. They made a meme out of his murder. Friend request, not accepted. Can you imagine the cold-heartedness of reducing a, a young 27-year-old sacrificing his life to a meme? The tragic murder of a 27-year-old man focused on loving people who are different than him was reduced to a meme by uncaring fools. Like I said, if it was just coming outside of the church, I get it. They're in darkness. Their hearts are closed to God. But you know, it's in the church. George Barna. <clears throat> 85%, the vast majority of pastors, I wonder why it's only 85%, believe missions is a mandate for all Christians. That should be 100% in my opinion. But look at the disconnect. Among practicing Christians, that number falls to 42%. And for all of Christians, it drops to one in four. One in four Christians believe in missions to cross-cultural people groups. Well, no wonder we're not getting the job done. Most of the Christians sitting in the pews don't think it's our responsibility to go tell anybody about Jesus. Well, <laughs> let's take these. I think we have to answer these challenges, and it's a perfect time when we observe the ascension of Jesus Christ, he went to heaven, he sent the Spirit, and before he left, he gave some instructions. Go into all ethnic groups. That seems pretty clear to me, but evidently to some Christians it's disputed, for Jesus wasn't talking to you personally. He was talking to uh, the 11. Well, man, that leaves out a lot of people. In fact, <laughs> side and sticker, uh, don't flatter yourself. You're not Luke or Peter or John. Jesus wasn't thinking about Christian evangelism in the future. He saw the end within the lifetime of his hearers. Side and sticker limits the Great Commission to the disciples, by which I think he means apostles, the 11, hear, um, hearing the commandment personally. But notice up here, he says, don't flatter yourself. You're not Luke or Peter or John. Luke didn't hear the Great Commission either. Luke was not an apostle. Luke wasn't a disciple of Jesus Christ. He came along later. But this guy knows just enough of the Bible to be dangerous. And he doesn't search the context. Matthew chapter 10, he says... <laughs> Um, Jesus expected the Great Commission to be done in his lifetime. Well, that's not what Matthew chapter 10 says at all. In fact, Matthew chapter 10 is pre-rejection by the Jews of Christ's message. 
He came and offered himself as the Messiah. He said, I've got all the credentials. I've got the genealogy. I've got this. I've got that. I'm fulfilling scripture. Here's the kingdom if you'll receive it. What did they do? Crucify him. We're not going to have any king over us but Caesar. And in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus changes his message. Here in chapter 10, he's telling his disciples, go to the people of Israel and tell them the king and the kingdom is here. It's at hand. And they did. They went out there. But they rejected that message. And so Jesus starts talking about not I'm the Messiah, make me king. I'm going to the cross, and you're going to kill me. So Matthew chapter 10 has nothing to do with Jesus' views on the future evangel evangelization of the world. Well, it's not everyone's job to evangelize. That's certainly true. <clears throat> he says, Paul says that we have different gifts. Yours isn't necessarily to evangelize. Notice the Great Commission does not say, go and make disciples of all nations if you have the gift of evangelism. Now, certainly some of you are gifted by God in evangelism. And I hope you haven't bought into the notion it's not your job. Of course it's your job. The rest of us who don't have the gift of evangelism, it's our job too. We still have to make disciples. We're not especially equipped to lead a lost person to the Lord, but we have the gospel, we have the Great Commission, we have opportunities all around us. Share your faith with unbelievers. <clears throat> now, while it's undoubtedly true, he's really begging the question. It remains that some have the gift of evangelism and that the commission was not only to the eleven, but to Paul, to Luke, to Timothy, all the way through the New Testament. Evangelize, train other faithful people to evangelize, do the work of evangelism way after Jesus left this earth. Romans 1, 14 to 16, I am under obligation, Paul says, both to the Greeks and to barbarians. Well, wait a second, I thought you were a Jew, Paul. What are you doing going cross-culturally? Why don't you stay in your tribe and just keep your mouth shut? No, he went to the Greeks, the Gentiles, the barbarians, and he says, I am under obligation. Why? Because he considered the, new, the, the Great Commission to be universal for Christians. Therefore, I am under obligation to share what I have in Jesus with people who don't have him. Verse 15, so for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Wait a second, Paul, that's a long way from home. That's a completely different culture, different language, different religion. What are you doing going over there? And oh, by the way, the church in Rome existed before Paul got there. So somebody left Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and broke the rules and went cross-culturally and started a church in Rome. And he says, man, I'm eager to come over there so I can have some fruit among you also. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, Matthew chapter 10, and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. That's one of the most frequently Old Testament scriptures quoted in the New Testament. The righteous man shall live by faith. Well, how are they going to hear unless somebody goes there and tells them? Third thing, there's no need for the Great Commission. Just imagine if your neighbor went to hell simply because you were too lazy to convince him that he was a broken sinner who needed what your church was selling. That hurts. We're not selling the gospel. We freely offer what we have freely received. We see a similar attitude in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. 
The king gives eternal life to those who lived honorable lives on earth. Evangelism and mandatory beliefs aren't necessary. Christians, discard the baggage of the Great Commission. There's work enough to live your life as a good Christian. If someone asks you, give a reason for your hope. In other words, the implication is, if they don't come and ask me about what I believe, I can't tell them. That sounds like the devil to me. <clears throat> my response to that is, my neighbor is not under God's wrath, nor will he be sent to hell for my failures to tell him. If he goes there, it will be because of his sin. The idea Christians can only share the good news if they ask us is from the devil. Number two, Matthew 25 again, just like Matthew 10 was before the gospel message of the church age, Matthew 25 is after the gospel message of the church age. Matthew 25 is in the tribulation. We're gone. Prophetically speaking, we're gone in the rapture. But notice, he says, uh, the sheep and goats judgment, uh, we're not supposed to, we're supposed to earn our salvation by being good people. That's what he says. What's the Bible say? Well, he misinterprets this. The sheep and goats judgment is based on Gentiles' treatment of Jews during the tribulation, not the church age. He falsely concludes that the sheep are saved by good works, and we are too. No one is ever saved by good works. That's impossible. You can't do enough good works to pay for your sins. The list is way too long. The debt is way too high. We are saved by grace through faith and once we're saved, we will do good works. Why? Because we love God. We want to serve Him. We're concerned about others. But the sheep are not saved by bringing a cup of water to a Jew. They are saved by believing that God and God's people are worthy, and they believe that there is such a God. They believe there's a, such a judgment, and they believe that Jews shouldn't be murdered by the Antichrist. And so they bring relief. They visit them in jail. They bring clothing. They help hide them from uh, Hitler and people like that. And, but they're not saved by the works. They're saved by a belief there is a God and his chosen people are the Jews. And those who bless the Jews, God will bless. Those who curse the Jews, God will curse. Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 17, Genesis chapter 22 the Abrahamic covenant. And so this man, and I, I don't doubt, uh, maybe he's a believer, that's up to him, but he has misrepresented Scripture to try to prove his point that the Great Commission is antiquated. It's even past antiquation. The Great Commission is offensive to God. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. <clears throat> this is just, I was trying to bring some uh, information to bear that the need, the need for us going to other people, it's, it, it's, it's still incredibly large. God is building his church and the need is great, but the power of God is greater. Now, there's a lot of people serving God full time. Um, 7.6% <clears throat> serve in another country. Most of them serve here, or at least in the West. The U.S. sends the most missionaries of any nation in the world. It also receives the most missionaries of any nation in the world. That's according to um, uh, the Atlas of Global Christianity. Uh, it's, it's 12 years old now. But look at all these people in unreached groups. India, 1.2 billion people there. And the church is growing, but man, there's so many people. Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, China, Japan, Iran, Turkey, Thailand, Nigeria. A people group is the largest group where the gospel can spread without language or cultural barriers. It's considered unreached people group if it's less than 2% evangelical. Well, why do we send workers abroad? 
why we, we put a, a world map on the wall back there, and we've got magnets representing where we are supporting some missionaries around the world. We have a, a pretty large budget for a church our size. $30,000 plus designated gifts go to foreign missions, not local, cross-cultural foreign missions. Why? If God doesn't want us to do that, we're, are we being stupid and bad stewards of his money because we're sending it to people who are out there on the front lines, risking their lives in many cases to bring a message that is repugnant to the dominant culture? It's like this meme. <clears throat> um, they, they reduce John Chow's sacrifice to a social media request for friendship. How utterly offensive. John Chow believed that unreached people group needed and deserved a gospel witness. It cost him his life. These people believe he wasted it. Oh, he should have gone somewhere else. I don't think so. So why do we send workers abroad? Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Whoever. Remember, Paul is writing to a church that is uh, outside of his culture. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. It wasn't that God just wanted the Great Commission for the Jews in Matthew chapter 10. God cares about Gentiles. That's what the whole Bible is about. That's what Israel was supposed to do. Witness to the Gentiles as you obey me and I bless you. And they got it wrong. And what is the church doing today? We're getting it wrong. Oh, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is just for us. So we can love each other and be nice. No, the power of the Holy Spirit was to be his witnesses in wherever, whatever culture you find an unbeliever, take the chance. Now, certainly you don't want to deliberately offend people and beat them over the head with your Bible. Understand them, ask questions, pull out of them their beliefs. And then when you establish they have a need for a Savior, do not be ashamed of the gospel, share him with them. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek on that level. The, the same Lord is Lord of all who call on him. Gentiles can be saved. I thought we knew that. In fact, all of us, I'm willing to bet, or almost all of us, we're Gentiles. Thank God he saves Gentiles. Whoever will call on the name will be saved. But how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? By the way, that's not just get them into church and have me berate them for their sinfulness. This preacher idea is someone to declare the truth. You can declare what you know to be true in any um, context where you rub shoulders with somebody. And by the way, look what God is doing. He's bringing all kinds of unbelievers to our shores. You don't have to learn another language. You don't have to go somewhere else to meet somebody different than you. You probably will today. Should we just ignore them? <clears throat> you know, this idea of reducing John Chow to uh, his murder, to just a group of people re re refusing his offer as friendship, how would these people recommend that we put the military at our southern border and anybody who dares cross the Rio Grande, we shoot them? I don't think they would. I hope not. Now, do we need borders? We need to vet people. We need to be careful, of course. We need to know who's coming in. Sure. 
We don't shoot them at the border, do we? So why is it okay for this tribal group of people out in the Indian Ocean? Is it okay to shoot a guy who brought some gifts to the beach? What are these people thinking? Romans 10 continued. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. People need to hear the Bible. And oh, by the way, there's still lots and lots of people groups that don't have the Bible in their language. One of the best things we can do is support people who are translating the Bible, the heart language, into thousands and thousands and thousands of people who don't have God's word. I made a a promise to myself a long time ago, for every Bible I buy, I donate a hundred bucks to uh, a Bible translating ministry. And now the Bibles are getting to be about a hundred bucks, so I have to raise that up a little bit. That was when Bibles were 1995, uh, a couple years ago. Invest in Bible translation. Invest in people who are saying, here I am, send me, Lord. I'll go to that place. Don't you realize that they shoot people there? Yeah, well, God will either protect me or he'll use my blood as the seedbed of the church. I have to go. I don't have to come back. I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their works to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses said, I will make you jealous, sorry for the typos, by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding will I anger you. That's Gentiles. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. In other words, he's not waiting for somebody to ask, would you please tell me about your Jesus? No, he goes to people who aren't seeking God to bring the life-saving gospel to them too. Israel provoked God to jealousy. And now he has set them aside temporarily. Why? To now use the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. And when the tribulation comes and two-thirds of the Jews in the world are murdered, the one-third remaining, Zechariah chapter 12, will finally call upon the Lord and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Jesus will save that remnant. God's not done with Israel yet. Why? He's still calling people out from all these ethnic groups to be Christians, to be part of the church to escape the coming judgment, the coming wrath, the coming tribulation. And you wonder if a guy who, the first week on the job, just initial contacts, gets himself killed. What could possibly good come out of that? Well, here's five guys that did the same thing. They flew over a couple days. They dropped gifts to the Alca Indians in, in Ecuador tried to make some friendly contacts. Finally, in the spirit of, the, of God and counting on his protection, they landed their little plane and they opened some dialogue. It wasn't very long and they were murdered, all five of them. You've heard of their names all your life. Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Peter Fleming, Roger Udarian, Ed McCauley. Did they think it was worth it? What did Jim say? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You cannot keep your life. You're going to lose it somewhere. People say, oh, these missionaries are crazy for going out there and giving their lives to, you know what? Americans give their lives to stuff every day. Is it going to count for eternity? Well, Jim Elliott thought, I can't keep my life anyway. I think I will invest it in something that I will never, ever lose. His faithful service and his sacrifice of his life, he fully expected to be rewarded by God. 
And nobody can touch that reward. Here's the plane they used. This is the pilot, Nate Saint. People who do not know the Lord ask why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are expending their lives, and when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for the years they have wasted. 1956. Say, man, what, what a waste. These guys were committed, intelligent, spiritual, brave men. Lasted less than a month on the job. What could come out of that? Well, I'm glad you asked. A church came out of that. The people that murdered these five martyrs became Christians when the widows and the orphans of those five martyrs went back and shared the love of Jesus. The tribe got saved. And not only did they get saved, they went cross-culturally to other tribes and preached the gospel. You say, what a waste, these five guys. No, it wasn't. A whole tribe of people heard the gospel. And some are in heaven, Revelation chapter 5, from every tribe and nation and tongue, giving glory to God. For the love of Christ controls us. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Am I living for myself? Are you living for yourself? Christ gave his life for you. Not just to save you, although that was certainly on his heart, but that you would go tell others about him. <clears throat> I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. That's Paul, Acts chapter 20, uh, in shackles, on his way to Rome. He's a prisoner, and he says, I'm okay with this. Because why? I got to lead members of Caesar's own household to faith in Jesus. Bring it on. Well, don't you know if you don't keep your mouth shut, we're going to chop your head off? Bring it on. Here's one of the first converts. Steve Saint is the son of Nick, Nate Saint, the pilot of that plane. He went back. God gave some of these widows, and some, you know, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, the, the widow of Jim Elliot. Some of these people had the privilege of forgiving the murderers of their husbands or fathers. They had the privilege of introducing them to someone greater than them who could forgive them of all of their sins, Jesus Christ. And a church got planted. That sounds like a victory to me. Why are we here? <clears throat> We've got opportunities right here. You don't have to go to Bangladesh. Talk to your neighbor. Volunteer for Vacation Bible School. We've got a couple, uh, four guys, two teams of of two, going door to door in our in South Siskiyou County, knocking on doors, inviting them to Christ, inviting them to church. Join them. Start your own team. Multiply. We don't have to go overseas to participate in the Great Commission. It's right here. It's right here. Now, I hope some of you will answer the call to go somewhere else. God's still building his church. He's still calling people to serve him. He's still providing and equipping, training. If we're not careful, we, we will become preoccupied with this building and uh, our comfort level. And, oh, uh, you know, I don't like the preaching. And, um, you know, I don't like it either, frankly. 
I don't like the music. I don't like the lights. I don't like the temperatures. I don't like this. I don't like that. Really? That's what we're worried about? When our neighbors are dying without Jesus. Perhaps you've heard this story about the life-saving. That's why I put this save this uh, lifesaver thing up there, a picture. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves went out day and night tirelessly seeking the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. It was so important. New boats were bought and new crews trained. The little life-saving station began to grow. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Few members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions. So they hired lifeboat crews to do this work for them. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decorations, and there was a miniature lifeboat in the room where the club invitations were held. But this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews bought, or brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them had black skin, and some had yellow skin. The beautiful new club was now in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities altogether. Since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club, some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was founded. And history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. I did a tally a couple years ago for the Board of Elders and I have no idea how accurate it is anymore, but Siskiyou County has about 41,000 people in it. South County has about 1,400 people. That's being generous to go to church. 1,400 of us who say we love Jesus, we believe in the authority of Scripture, we believe lost people are going to hell, and there's 39,000 people, evidently, who don't believe that, or else they'd be in church. They're out there in the tossed seas of life. Divorce, drugs, all kinds of idolatry and immorality. And they're increasingly hearing less and less of the gospel. Why? Because there are some people who say the Great Commission is no longer relevant. And who do you think you are telling other people there's only one way to heaven? Well, that's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I want to hear what Jesus has to say about this 
than some fool who makes fun of a 27-year-old man who gave his life to try to establish contact with a lost tribe. There's another young guy, 29 years old, Jim Elliott. God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life that I may burn for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. Jesus was about 33. He died. Do you think his life was worth anything? So let's pray. Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember those five missionaries in went to the Alka Indians. We remember John Chow. We remember thousands and thousands, in fact, who have given their life to service. Some with what appears to be great success. They, they served for years and years and years, and churches were established, and there's great success. Others appear like, wow, three days on a beach and you're dead? God, only heaven will reveal how you've rewarded these guys. I'm sorry I haven't done a better job. And by your power that you promised through the Holy Spirit, I resolve to do better. Thank you in Christ's name, amen. Revelation 5, 1, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And he came, and he took out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Lord, we thank you for that uh, glimpse into the future that should motivate us for the present to put you first to seek opportunities, God, to share the life-saving and changing message of the good news that Jesus paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. We cannot add anything to that, but we must appropriate that payment personally by faith. I pray for those gathered in this room, God. We've heard a challenge today from your scriptures. We've seen examples from real human beings who laid down their lives for you. God, thank you for our salvation. We are under obligation to share that message with others before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen.